so explosive and volatile. I'm almost afraid to have him on the program as Eric Kane and walk on balls. I mean, he, I don't know what he's going to say. I, I mean, it, I don't know where it's going to go, but uh, I'm, I'm glad he's on the program now. Eric, how are you, sir? That, that sounds just like me, but uh, no, nah, I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> hey, tell us about what all is going on uh, with Locked on Balls. First of all, you're doing a great job with that. And I know the switch over from Ball Quest uh, on three, major kudos. Pass this along too, to Brent Hubson um, and, and all the guys. Absolutely love what you guys are doing. But uh, as you focus on Locked on Balls and, and on three, uh, you're, you're a busy dude. Yeah, uh, football season's always busy. Uh, now with the move over to on three, and I got a whole lot going on. It's been so much fun with that transition. Super excited to be there, and of course, inviting all Tennessee fans to join us over there if you want to come and hang out. Incredible deals, but working with Brent Hubbs, awesome prize, Rob Lewis. Uh, it's been a whole lot of fun. So uh, that's been going well. Locked on balls, the podcast, man. It's it's my baby, man. I as you very well know, like I I love it. It's uh it, it's so much fun. It's a platform and it's a community continues to grow and uh just talking tennessee football every single day so things are good i'm glad football's back yeah i am too and let me let me just start with the most loaded question in the history of man are you ready what's up okay where would you rank tennessee in the top 25 after what you saw over the weekend i, th I think it's about right about 23 24 somewhere around there i put them in i mean they were I understand if you're not inside the top 25 and you're receiving votes, especially in preseason, like it just kind of is what it is. I mean, it's not a true ranking beyond 25. It's why you kind of saw Florida jump all the way from like 38 or 39 to 12. Um, and I mean, that was a huge win for Florida, but I still thought that was a huge leap for Florida. But still, um, I, I would put them about 23, 24. You knew Tennessee would slide in with a win against Ball State simply because Arkansas and Cincinnati were playing and, and the loser of that game would fall out. So I wouldn't have went much higher. Now, you win against Pittsburgh this week. You're probably going to jump inside the top 20, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but I think 23, 24, 24 where they're at, uh, that's that's probably just about perfect. And um, I know Tim Banks was asked, the defensive coordinator, about the lack of sacks. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you played ball in college, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, Carson okay. Newman. All right, so I saw a lot of stunts and, and, and twists, and I, I think that – I think Tim Banks was trying to do two things. One, he was trying to give Pittsburgh a lot of looks. But two, he also wasn't going to run his guys out there consistently and and and, and try to show more than he had to. So you can just kind of talk about that from the trenches standpoint of is it bad that Tennessee didn't have a sack or is it just okay or your thoughts? Well, first of all, I don't think it's the end of the world. I mean, it's Ball State. You want to have some TFLs. You want to get home and, and bring the quarterback down. So the fact that it didn't happen uh, is, is not great. I mean, their game plan was to get the ball out quickly. I understand that. That's football sometimes, right? And Tyler Barron was speaking on it earlier this week about how you just continue to rep, 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 and then you get back there and the ball's gone, and it could be frustrating at times. But um, you still need to find a way to get home. Now, you know, they, they were not – completely bland i think their game plan on defense was very vanilla i've said that all week now that does not mean they didn't do anything they did some things up front not a whole lot they didn't blitz a whole lot from the second level though they did a little bit early in the football game and a little bit later on i think you're going to see a whole lot more this week against pittsburgh um simply put i just think that you didn't have to do that uh, against ball state and and not necessarily uh, that you wanted to keep it off film but i mean i think that's a plus as well um, so I, I think the main goal for Tim Banks and, and Tennessee's defense was to win the football game, play a whole lot of guys, get a look at a whole lot of guys like Elijah Herring, Joshua Josephs, um, some of these cornerbacks, Christian Charles, and that was mission accomplished. So I expect Tennessee to be very much more aggressive defensively in the games up front, even though they did some things, but I think they'll do a whole lot more this coming up uh, this, this game in Pittsburgh. So – uh, going, let's go to the other side of the ball offensively here. How do you think Tennessee is going to fare against uh, a defense like Pitt? What do you think the game plan will look like for that? Um, and who do you think really stands out in this game? Yeah, Tennessee offensively against Pittsburgh's defense. You know, Pat Narduzzi is going to dial it up. He's a great defensive coach, a really good front seven uh, instructor. So, these these running backs, uh, they were not challenged whatsoever. Jabari Small said, hey, we didn't get a pass pro set at all against Ball State. 
they're going to get that this week. And so, you know, linebacker screaming off the edge, a, a defensive tackle, and Elijah uh, Cancy, I believe is his name, a defensive tackle, really nice impact player, you know, streaming through the A-gap. These running backs are going to have to step up and protect their quarterback. And so I'm intrigued to see what that looks like. Um, so whether you keep a tight end for a six- or seven-man protection, the running back stepping up, uh, I, I think that's going to be a point of emphasis for you know protecting Hendon Hooker to get some looks downfield. Ball State dropped eight on third downs, but Tennessee couldn't throw the ball downfield on Thursday, and it was fine. You were just nickel and diamond the entire time down the field, and that was that was okay. Now, Pat Narduzzi, when he joined the nation, uh, Vault Network's nation on Sunday night, he was talking about the tempo with Tennessee. Obviously, he's played against Josh Heupel now. This will be the fourth time dating back to his days at, at UCF, and um, he's very familiar with the tempo, saying that Tennessee gets the ball out in game one under 14 seconds, 71% of the time. And so that tempo is going to be Tennessee's best friend, obviously, and you can't prepare for a tempo. So I'm intrigued to see the running backs and pass protection and intrigued to see what Tennessee's tempo looks like because I think Pittsburgh's defense, which didn't have the best day, uh, is is not going to be ready for that, te- for that tempo again. You said can't prepare for tempo. And I had a gentleman come up to me just the other day and say something I thought was really insightful and something that I've actually thought, that it was like the veer back in the day. You mm-hmm. couldn't prepare for that the week before. So, you, I mean, you played ball, so I uh, know offense bomb. But on the flip side, I mean, that's really tough to prepare for in a week. I would imagine tempo is kind of like, I think it is, the modern-day version of that to overcome maybe some shortcomings on your roster. Yeah, and so essentially when you're playing scout team, you know, when, when, when you're in practice and you break off in the team, the offense is going over there, you know, in team preparing for the opponent's defense. The defense is over here preparing for the opponent's offense. The scout team is looking at plays on a, on, a, on a card. You're going out there and running that play and coming back. I mean, you can't physically replicate what Tennessee does via a scout team look in practice. Like, it's impossible. Sure, you can coach them up to go fast. You can do as much as you can. But there's no way possible that unless you get your entire scout team to memorize the plays, it's almost like game planning for practice every single day. Uh, that's just it's just impossible. That's what I mean by that. And so, it, you know, I mean, even Georgia, it took Georgia a quarter to figure that out last year against Tennessee. Now, Georgia was eventual national champions. They figured it out and, and, and kind of went from there. Alabama struggled with the tempo at, at parts throughout the entire ball game last season. The good teams will adjust. And so. You know, we'll see how long it takes Pittsburgh to adjust, but that's what I mean by the tempo. And, um, of course, it's it, a lot of people can say it's a, kind of a gimmicky offense or whatever with Josh Heupel. I mean, Tennessee broke eight school records on offense a season ago. I think he'll, I, I think he'll take that every single year if he can continue to, to score points and win football games. Yeah, it's only gimmicky until it, it works, and then it's just called successful. Yeah. So, so question for you, what – individual player do you see an individual player that that you're expecting to stand out in this game like somebody you know who to watch during the game if it's a if it's a wide receiver if it's a running back a defensive back who are your who do your eyes go to in this game well obviously you want to see your playmakers make some big time plays Cedric Tillman Brew McCoy out there on the perimeter um you want to see Jabari Small run the ball well Pat Narduzzi was not happy, not happy with the way his defense you know, played against the run. West Virginia averaging almost six yards a carry in the backyard mm-hmm. brawl. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm, looking, I'm looking at Jabari Small on on offense because as much as everybody thinks Tennessee throws the football, and, and it does, Tennessee's offense starts with the run game, and Josh Hype will be there first to tell you that. So Jabari Small on offense. And then defensively, I just think this is a Jeremy Banks game, you know, sitting right there in the middle, um, you know, playing linebacker. He is very much a run stopping type guy. He didn't play the best game, you know, in terms of grades, you know, per pro football focus. I know that's not everything, uh, but he never will in that regard. But like, you know, you, you get a team that's going to run the ball right at you. I think this could be a Jeremy Banks game. Again, Pittsburgh attempted 38 rushes the other night, averaged two yards per carry, which is, which is not good. So uh, Jeremy Banks with the with, with with stopping the run. And then Tennessee's defense needs to be ready for play-action pass because Keaton Slovis will make it a point to go run, run, play-action pass, throw over the top. Tennessee's safeties need to get back and get their eyes on the right spot as well. So Banks, McCullough, and then, Jer- and then uh, Jabari Small on offense. Well, let me ask you, <clears throat> as far as preparation, again, you played on the offensive side, but uh, as, as, as far as preparation – for this this Tennessee offense, um, I'm 
I'm just curious. Do you think that they'll drop eight um, like we saw Ball State do? Do you think they'll bring pressure, or do you think they'll rely on the front four uh, to essentially do the pressure? Because it's a much better defense line, needless to say. Yeah, I mean, I think I think they're going to dial it up and bring pressure. I think at times they can try to rely on their front four. They've got a defensive end by the name of Baldonado, um, an Italian that had nine sacks a season ago. I mentioned the defensive tackle, Cansey. I think he had seven or eight sacks a season ago. Uh, John Morgan the third, another defensive end, um, had a sack there, had two sacks the other night. So they've got a pretty decent and experienced front four. I think they can rely on at times. But also I think that they're going to bring some pressure from the second level and try to really mix some things up. Uh, they got a linebacker by the name of Dennis that had 90 tackles uh, last year, led him with 10 tackles uh, you know, last week against West Virginia. So I, I think that you're going to see a whole lot more of that. I, I don't think you're going to see much drop eight and say, all right, just throw it in front of us and, and we'll see if we can go tackle you. Um, I, I truly do believe that it's going to be more of a, you know, the normal man in the back end, you know, mixing in some some zones in two to three, but really trying to get after Tennessee's offensive line, making it difficult for Hendon Hooker to beat them uh, to beat them with his arm. Please hit that like and subscribe button. Don't forget Eric Kane on Locked On Balls. I know Amanda has another one for you, I believe. But I just wanted to, uh, real quick, from your X's and O's standpoint, the fact that you did play, how different is this offense? And we just saw West of the West Virginia game. But how different is this offense this year as opposed to what Tennessee saw against Pitt with a Blitnikoff award winner and a, a first-round pick in the NFL draft quarterback? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's a little different. I mean, Kenny Pickett, as you mentioned, first-round quarterback. I had a lot of Heisman hype a season ago. Really good quarterback. Jordan Addison, Blitnikoff Award winner. Now he's at Southern Cal and made the most of his game one over there. Um, so I would say it's less explosive. You know, they've got a receiver, a big-time receiver in Jared Wayne. They've got a, a Mumpfield's another receiver that's experienced. A former Tennessee receiver that was here all the way back in 2019, I want to say. Gerard Means, he, he, plays a, he plays a role in there as well. They've got a a tight end by the name of Bartholomew. Tennessee's had a couple of those here. So they are going to go back to what Pitt traditionally is offensively under Narduzzi and running the football less pass happy. Um, Mark Whipple, the offensive coordinator, is no longer there. They brought in a new offensive coordinator. So having said all of that, you know Keaton Slovis is a guy that is not a bad quarterback, had a great first three years at Southern Cal, had a great first game, even though he only had 16 pass attempts against West Virginia. Um, I'm going to see more running of the football, more play action, less spreading it out, less running around with Kenny Pickett, trying to make some plays offensively and and more of a – this is going to be more of a a football team that has a defensive coordinator as a head coach, much like Jeremy Pruitt was here at Tennessee. So that's kind of the difference, I think, offensively and and from Pitt last year to to Pitt this year. All right, last thing. Uh, Score prediction? What What are you seeing here? Oh, man, I have not given my official score prediction just yet. Uh, I I, I think Tennessee will win this game. You know, I I think Tennessee can get over 30. I'll say about Tennessee 34, Pittsburgh 21 or 24. I think Tennessee can win this game. I think it'll be, you know, by a touchdown or 10 points or so. Uh, I don't think it'll be a blowout uh, one way or the other. But I I do like Tennessee on the road. I've liked Tennessee all offseason in this matchup. And uh, nothing's changed since, uh, since both these teams played on Thursday. I want to get to uh, East Field. I got one, one last question for you, and it's from John. Why don't they blitz Burrell so we don't have to worry about his coverage? <laughs> Ouch. That's brutal. What was that, John? Uh, oh, but- man. Look, I, I'll say this. I'm a, I'm a big PFF guy. I like to look at the stats. And according to PFF Pro Football Focus, Warren Burrell was targeted a team high 11 times um, in, in the game against Ball State. The next highest, I think, was Kamal Haddon maybe with five, or Christian Charles with four. So, you know, Pittsburgh, Ball State, they've all watched the film. They're going to go and pick on Warren Burrell each and every time. In those 11 targets, Burrell gave up six receptions for, I think, 41 yards. So he plays consistent. There's a reason he's out there. But until he proves he is not the weak link, then teams are going to continue to pick on him. So we'll see how he responds. Obviously, uh, I think Tim Banks is pleased with him, saying his day was uneventful, which – I guess is a good thing. It's not necessarily a great thing, but uh, uneventful is better than horrible uh, against Ball State for for Warren Burrell. Tell you what, Eric, uh, I've I've been a fan from afar for a while. Keep up the great work. And, uh, again, locked on balls. I know some 
some guy started that. I think he flamed out. I don't know what's happening with that Josh Ward guy. <laughs> but um, you're also uh, throwing heat with uh, on three and ball quest. So keep it up, man. I uh, really enjoy this stuff. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. And uh, I love love the content you're putting out there and ha- would love to join again. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Eric Kane, Locked on Balls and on three.